Um, but let's look at the hijackers a little bit. So what we've been told about the hijackers is that these were Muslim fundamentalists who were so devoutly Islamic that they were ready to kill for their cause and um, sacrifice their lives as suicide pilots. Um, well, the history of Al-Qaeda actually goes back to pre-9-11. It actually goes back even before what I'm going to talk about here, but I'm going to, I'm going to enter in here in the 1980s um, when the CIA and, a, and a, basically the CIA equivalent in Pakistan, uh, um, the, it's called the Inner Services um, Intelligence, uh, what is it, Inter ISI, Inner Services in Intelligence, um, coordinated uh, to expel uh, the Soviets from Afghanistan. And they did it by fostering Muslim uh, fundamentalism in Afghanistan. This actually included even sending textbooks in that incited a lot of militaristic thinking. Um, another thing that they did is that they imported a lot of radicals into the U.S. for military training and then sent them back to Afghanistan to fight the Soviets. Okay, This was called Operation Cyclone. You can Wikipedia it, but it's basically common knowledge. This is not something... You might not be reading it in the paper every day, but there's, there's dozens of sources where you can read about this. It's not controversial. Um, so here we've got Michael Springman, who was the head of the U.S. consulate in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, um, at that time, back in the 80s, during Operation Cyclone. And on a BBC Newsnight report, which you can actually Google and watch the report online, Greg Pallas interviews Michael Springman, and he says, In Saudi Arabia, I was repeatedly ordered by high-level State Department officials to issue vis visas to unqualified applicants. Um, and he, he later found that this was being done by the CIA and that these were basically Operation Cyclone trainees. So Jeddah here, this U.S. consulate in Jeddah is an entry port for Muslim fundamentalists to get into the U.S. and train during the war in Afghanistan. Why is that relevant to 9-11? Well, um, 15 of the 19 9-11 hijackers got their visas from that same consulate. Uh, the, head of the, the head of the Pakistani ISI on 9-11 was in Washington, D.C. on the morning of 9-11, dining with Porter Goss, who's currently the head of our CIA. Okay, this is a straight out of a, a book written by Senator Bob Graham of Florida. Um, the head of the ISI authorized a $100,000 wire transfer to the person that's thought to be the lead hijacker under the official version of events, Muhammad Atta, a week before 9-11. This was reported in the India Times and the Wall Street Journal. So we have these same kinds of CIA, Pakistani ISI, Jeddah Consulate, connections that were actually have a much longer history that go back long before 9-11. They're active on 9-11, and the incredible thing about this is that none of this has been investigated. Now, think for yourself for a minute. What would have happened if the Times of India and the Wall Street Journal had discovered that Saddam Hussein had wired $100,000 to lead hijacker Muhammad Atta in the weeks before 9-11? Do you think you would have heard about that? In, in my book, Crossing the Rubicon, The Decline of the American Empire at the End of the Age, which is like 600 pages, 1,000 footnotes. It's, it, it's in the Harvard Biz Library. It's a reference book now. It's, it's a very popular... And it's used in teaching. Very much, in many universities. And it's like it, way high on, on the Amazon poli-sci reference list. Uh, so it's, it's never been challenged. But, and what I track in that, and here I give great credit to another researcher who was working from the time of 9-11 on, Paul Thompson, who had an incredible ter the, the terror timeline. You can Google that. You'll find it instantly. It's all tied to mainstream news sources around the world, whether it's Times of India, Times of Pakistan, Al Jazz. But major publications that you and I know follow standard rules of journalism. <laughs> and extremely clear evidence from 9-11 on. I mean, major stories, incredible publications. I have uh, respect for Al Jazz, but they weren't the only one. There were many others. You're talking about Al Jazeera? Al, yes. And sorry, that's the... No, it's fine. I just want to be clear. Uh, that Osama bin Laden was dead in 2002, 2003, the latest 2004 as a result of kidney failure and dialysis. And it was generally assumed, and I am still, and I have been still plugged into the intelligence community, SEAL team members and members of CIA and so forth. So this is difficult to believe in the sense that, one, a lot of people in the Arab world doubted that this was the killing of Osama bin Laden. I mean, that was the headline, that they were lying. So if they... If Al Jazeera and, and other uh, intelligence sources in the Arab world, why would they have doubted what they were saying and not have said what you're saying? 
uh, not said he was already killed. And number two, why didn't the Bush administration use this as a way to show how effective their war on terror had become? Well, if bin Laden had died on his own outside of custody, that would essentially mean that he won. He avoided capture. For his, for his whole life. But I personally I believe, and there's an enormous amount of evidence showing that Osama bin Laden was a CIA creation. Uh, the, the bin Laden uh, family runs a major construction company in Saudi Arabia, very closely tied to the royal family. Major government contracts, there were CIA connections. And to, connections to the Bush family as well. Uh, and major connections to the Bush family, which are probably too long to go into now, but they're all footnoted in uh, Rubicon. Uh, and, and I believe him to have been a total creation of the Central Intelligence Agency to be someone that we can put up as a, as a straw man to fight and to blame on because it's, it, it, well, leaving aside the fact that it's technically impossible for 19 hijackers working from a cave to accomplish what happened on September 11th. Uh, but uh, I don't think we can put that aside. I think we're going to have to stop there and okay. ask you because, I mean, I think that somebody who's listening is going to say maybe that's almost a po an apologist kind of attitude that we are too great for 19 guys to have gotten in here and maybe it was a tremendous failure of, uh, of the American intelligence community. You know what the real the reason that's been given by the government for how these hijackers were able to accomplish what they accomplished. You believe actually that um, the uh, that it, you said this in your book Crossing the Rubicon, uh, published in 2004, and you claim that Dick Cheney and the U.S. government uh, were in collusion with the perpetrators of 9-11. And I want to know, on what evidence yeah. are you basing those claims? Okay. Uh, collusion, I think, is, is, is uh, a I bit... Say, yeah, let it happen. I guess, I mean... Oh, misleading. What, no, what's the word no. you would use? The, the attacks were orchestrated by Dick Cheney. They were maestroed by Dick Cheney, and that goes to the chapter on war games that I wrote in the book where I have absolute on-the-record information from U.S. Air Force sources uh, showing that uh, 24 false radar blips were injected onto radar screens during the hijackings themselves in war game exercises directly under the control of Vice President. Of the okay, Vice so President. Can you please explain. Okay, first of all, let me ask you, why do you object to the use of the word collusion? Because... Uh, Collusion would, in, would to me, imply you have this group who could do one thing and this group, and they decide to cooperate together. No, the whole thing was run at the U.S. government level. Uh, the undisputed records that... Uh, so these hijackers are essentially assets, then? Well, we have undisputed records, and, and, and here I cited stories from ABC, NBC, Newsweek, and, and, and so forth. You, you don't want to challenge them. Showing that Mohammed Atta and uh, Hazmi's, several of the hijackers had attended military flight training schools. Uh, uh, Atta, I think, at Maxwell Air Force Base in Florida. But in point of fact, uh, none of the, of, of the hijackers aside from the ones that it was known to have attended military schools, uh, had, had obtained a pilot's license, let alone the ability to fly a multi-engine jet aircraft which requires an instrument rating and perform maneuvers that fighter pilots wouldn't want to perform. 